All right, good morning, everybody. Um, this is one of three discussion panels that focus on grand challenges that emerged from our younger faculty that held a workshop several months ago and developed ideas uh, of research areas on which they want to spend their careers working. So this first one is on um, sustainable urban waterfronts. We have a distinguished panel of five speakers, one of whom seems to be doing his exercises for this morning. Um, uh, the first panel member, Joseph Lee, is a native of Hong Kong, but was educated at MIT, where he received his uh, bachelor's, master's, and PhD in civil engineering between 1969 and 1977. Um, he returned to Hong Kong in 1980, where he became a lecturer in civil engineering at the University of Hong Kong. He took administrative responsibilities of dean of engineering and provost chancellor. He then moved to the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology to be the Vice President for Research. Joseph is a fellow of the Hong Kong Academy of Engineering, the American Society of Civil Engineers, and the UK Royal Academy of Engineering. Um, Claire Welty, to, to his right, to the left as you're looking at our panel, also has ties to MIT, getting her PhD from there in 1989 following a master's at George Washington and a bachelor's from U University of Virginia. She's a professor uh, of engineering at UMBC and director of their Center for Urban Environmental Research and Education. Uh, and Claire played a prominent role in an NSF-funded LTER program that focused on Baltimore as an urban ecosystem and conducted groundbreaking research as the, in the role of urban ecosystems. Her research interests focus on developing end-to-end -end models that assimilate data uh, from the environment to predict the urban hydrological cycle. Our third panelist, William Narden, is an assistant professor at UMSIS at the Horn Point Laboratory. He holds a PhD from the University of Rome, uh, where he also had his bachelor's and master's degree. William is a geomorphologist with interests in how the built environment interacts with aquatic ecosystems. Our fourth panelist, Lisa Wanger, is a research professor at UMSIS at the Chesapeake Biological Lab. She's one of our own, having obtained her PhD from the Mies program in 1997, following a bachelor's from the UC Santa Cruz. Lisa is an environmental economist with a long history of working with the Maryland Port Administration on the economics of placement of dredge material and on incentives to promote sustainable development. And our final panelist, Eric Schacht, is a research associate professor from UMSIS uh, here at IMET, and he's a molecular biologist with a PhD in genetics from that other institution in Massachusetts, from Harvard Me Me Medical School. Um, he holds a BA from Reed College in Portland, Oregon, and he's part of a team of researchers from UMSIS funded by the Franz Merrick Foundation who are working with NGOs and the community to co-develop research needs for the inner harbor. Um, I've asked each panelist to make short presentations, and then as with the panel before, we'll have opportunities for questions from the audience. So our first panelist, Professor Joseph Lee. Uh, good morning, uh, dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I'm very happy to be here to uh, honor the inauguration of uh, uh, President Peter Goodwin, and also to participate in this very interesting discussion on uh, interdisciplinary research on grand challenges. So I, I was asked to speak for about seven to 10 minutes on um, the challenges facing urban ports and what are the large research programs. So, uh, well, so I, I hope to give you an Asian perspective, uh, Asia 58% of the world's population. I don't know how to advance this, so uh, this just uh, the, uh, the one. Okay, this on top. Okay. Uh, so I'd like to suggest uh, uh, really a lot of what we uh, face in, in urban parts, and many of them are uh, mega cities of the world, uh, and uh, are really population growth, climate change, urbanization. And also the growth of the importance of innovation and technology 
as a driver of the economy. Uh, and what I want to also touch on uh, very briefly is this idea of ecological civilization, uh, which is used as a slogan by President Xi Jinping in everything China does. So I want to just say a few words on that. Now, so Hong Kong. I, I think many of you have been to Hong Kong, mega city. Uh, and we have a beautiful harbor, and we have a beautiful international port. But I think the thing about international port is, of course, it's, it's used for many, many purposes, as I outlined here. Water supply, waste disposal, fisheries management, uh, recreation and tourism are big business. And also large-scale reclamation, like for land supply. And, and you know, you've got to think of uh, these mega cities in Asia, all over Asia, kind of as part of, in Hong Kong, as part of the Greater Bay Area, a bit like Chesapeake Bay. So I, I'd like to just list uh, a couple of challenges. Uh, so, first is just smart environmental management. You know, uh, what will be kind of a healthy urban port be like uh, in the smart green cities of tomorrow? So here, as you can see, I just list uh, several things we've been doing uh, in terms of uh, environmental forecasting, uh, beach water quality forecasting, because we, we in, in the smart city, of tomorrow will be moving into real-time systems. And that will uh, entail many, many scientific issues. And very close to Chesapeake Bay, uh, we are also very interested in fisheries management, in eutrophication, in red tides, algal blooms. And I'll say a few words on this. I mean, we, of course, uh, very uh, uh, coastal resilience is very important, but that's a, a slightly different topic. So, smart environmental management, I would suggest, is, a, is a, a challenge to international ports like Hong Kong uh, because increasingly, you know, with uh, water quality becoming more and more sophisticated, you know, EDC, ECC, emerging chemical compounds that we don't really understand uh, very well. Uh, that, so, uh, secondly, fisheries management red tides is, uh, I would say, in our part of the world, it is becoming very, very important. And the entire issue of how to integrate with this big data revolution, as pointed out previously. So I just uh, note, make note of a few things. Now, I picked this topic to spend a few minutes on, which is food security, uh, sustain sustainable intensification of agriculture. And it has a close relationship with fisheries management in our part of the world. You know, Asia accounts for 90% of the world's aquaculture. And Asia also consumes 60% of the food fish. So as the population grows, we really don't have enough food. And, and so you have to go for intensification of agriculture and FAO UNFAO is, is very much into it. So, so the question is, then, then scientific management becomes very important, and that has a lot to do with algal blooms and red tides because of the eutrophication that occurs in all our urban parts in these, uh, along the Pearl River estuary. And, and the reason I mention this, uh, partly is that we all learned from Chesapeake Bay in, in the beginning. I mean, you have the you know, Chesapeake Bay models, WASP. You know, a lot of this initial science comes, comes from here, and I think, but it hasn't gone away. We had, uh, and it has a lot to do with climate change. Uh, we had, uh, uh, 1998 was El Nino year. We had a massive red tide. But then it didn't go away. It, it came back, uh, sorry, it came back again. Uh, wait a minute, let me see the, the Backwards. Sorry about this. Um, okay. So. Oh, okay. Uh, need only training. Okay. So, so sorry about this. Uh, so very quickly, 
Uh, but anyway, the idea is uh, we, we would like to develop uh, some uh, forecasting ability because it, it didn't go away. Last year, 2015, it came back again uh, with different species and so on. So right now, uh, what we are working on, I was asked to say some suggest big programs. We are actually working with Woods Hole, our oceanographic institution, to develop uh, a capability for early warning system uh, using real-time phytoplankton monitoring. Uh, and nowadays, one perspective of big data is that a lot of sensors become a lot more uh, very affordable. Uh, and UAV, USV, or whatever you have. And then recently what we did is just a very simple drone that, that one of our alumni, DJI uh, manufacturer, you, just, you can just use a simple drone and map surface chlorophyll in a way that's never been possible before. A remote sensing has never worked in Hong Kong because of clouds and so on. So anyway, these are some of the, some of the um, uh, approaches. Uh, we are working with Woods Hole on the big data, using big data in species identification, for example. I think that that's, these are the, I think, uh, kind of frontiers opened up by industry in research. Now, I want to just say, uh, I mean, there are many things, but I want to just say one more theme that we are uh, embarking on, which is this idea of ecological civilization. I mentioned this is at the core of China's strategic development. And all it is, is really, is a slogan, but it, all it is, is really put conservation, put conservation above everything else. And in terms of conservation, of course, one of the grand challenges is water. And in every city, you lose about 20% water due to leakage alone, because most of the pipes are underground. And it is a long-standing problem, one of, uh, we have a, ongoing uh, large-scale, uh, what we call theme-based research project uh, on really uh, using big data, because now you have very, very far f high frequency response instruments. My, my colleague is leading this. We're all in this smart urban water supply systems, working with big data and really figuring out where the leakages are, where the defects are underground using pressure waves. And, and that's uh, some of the industry problem uh, that's, that's facing us. So uh, I think in, in general, water, in terms of water, there, there are a lot of uh, these areas. But I just single out two, uh, which I thought uh, this environmental forecasting and this fisheries management, red tides, which are still outstanding, actually AP is still outstanding many in the stream problem, and, and very much related to sustainability. Uh, as an illustration. Uh, thank you. So our, our second speaker is Claire Welty, who will remind us that ports are where the land and the water meet. Claire. Okay, so um, this cover slide is showing um, urban hydrography draped on the urban landscape. And so this is something we work on that we find to be an extreme challenge. This is where geosciences meets civil engineering. Um, and so um, I'm going to speak to you particularly about work that's been going on in Baltimore as may be related to healthy harbors, um, just very briefly. So. One, one of the prongs of our research, with many aspects, including a social science research, one of the prongs of the research that we do at UMBC um, in partnership with the Baltimore Ecosystem Study is using the watershed approach to study urban ecosystems. So as you can see here from this map of Baltimore, we have, you know, the landscape drains into the harbor. So the idea is that we need to understand what's going on into the landscape as part of understanding what's going on with, say, water quality and living resources in the harbor. So this is just a, a map they are showing um, on the left, the, the, the Gwynn's Falls watershed, then the Jones Falls and the Herring Run watershed, and then the, the watershed's draining straight to the, the Baltimore Harbor. So it's key. So one of the things I'm going to talk about is how we use the watershed approach um, in urban ecology. And it's, again, it's only one prong of urban ecology. So this is the kind, these are the kinds of studies we carry out using the 
watershed approach to study urban ecosystems? Well, we analyzed stream drainage, water quantity and quality, and I'll show you a map and an example. Um, what we can do is we can apply disturbances and analyze the response to the disturbance. We can analyze internal dynamics of the systems. And we can analyze long-term responses to subtle changes if we've collected data and done analysis over the long term. So the tools that we use are observations, statistical analysis, and modeling. And um, in terms of the Baltimore Ecosystem Study, this has been going on for 20 years. So I just thought I would just show you a map of the studies that are ongoing, um, that have been ongoing for 20 years, um, that, that I've been affiliated with. And so you can see on this map, you can see just as a location for the visitors that, that are not in this region, the, um, you see the, the Chesapeake Bay there and the Gunpowder Patapsco, um, which is called a Huck 8 uh, drainage system, drains west to the, to the Chesapeake Bay. And so embedded with that, we have these watersheds draining to the Baltimore Harbor, which in turn drains to the Chesapeake Bay. So where I've been involved and a Baltimore ecosystem study has been involved for 20 years is the, the watershed shown on the right, which is the Gwynn's Falls watershed. I should just back up and say for those of you who don't know, um, National Science Foundation funds a network of 26 sites around the country, um, the Long-Term Ecological Research Network, and of those sites, to collect data and analyze data for the long term. Um, and of those sites, two are urban, one is Phoenix and one is Baltimore. So when I say the Baltimore Ecosystem Study, that's where I'm referring to as this long-term study that was started in 1998. So at any rate, you can see there um, for the Gwynn's Falls watershed, what the red dots show are USGS stream gauging stations where he, we have partnered with USGS to measure water levels and calculate discharge for over 20 years across an urban to rural gradient. So at the north end of the watershed is ex-urban areas where you can still see cornfields out in the Glendon area. And then as we move on down to the city, we become more urbanized. So the idea is we, we, measure, we, measure, we measure water level and calculate discharge through rating curves at, in partnership with these USGS gauging stations. And then we conduct weekly sampling of water quality to establish this long-term record so that we can evaluate what's going on um, with these long-term data series across this urban to rural gradient. So that's been one approach, and the way this can relate to healthy harbors is that the water quality, certainly draining out of the Gwynn's Falls watershed, would be contributing to a water quality or um, in, in the harbor. So just as an example of the long, kind of long-term data series we collect, this is the, um, the signature slide that you would see from Peter Groffman at any conference, and I'm sure many of you heard, have heard him speak before. Peter Groffman is the deputy director of the Baltimore Ecosystem Study, and he's our nitrate man. Um, so what this is just showing is the power of long-term data collection. So our field technicians go out and collect water quality samples across those red dots. They've been doing that once a week for 20 years. And this, this is just showing data up through 2014. Uh, we have data up through present time, but this just shows you the power of looking at long-term trends as opposed to some shorter period of time where you wouldn't capture these long-term trends. So what may not be surprising is the blue line across the bottom, our reference forested watershed, the nitrogen deposition from the atmosphere is taken up by the plants, and you just see these very low levels of nitrate in the streams. It may also not be surprising that our agricultural watershed is showing high levels of nitrate, the red line, although you know, we might question, well, what's going on with the dip and then the increase, and that is, can, can serve as impetus for investigations. But may, what be more surprising is what's going on with the suburban watershed. So when we see these long-term data sets, they provide impetus for asking other questions and doing other studies to figure out what's going on with these trends. So we use long-term data to evaluate trends. We use them to make predictions, but we also use them to ask questions about what, what the internal dynamics are, the internal mechanisms of what's going on. So in the case of the Glinden watershed, we did nitrogen and oxygen and isotope analysis, and it turns out that the, the high nitrate concentrations were due to leaking sewers. So, you know, we, you know, you can sort of document that, that source, and um, if you want to reduce the nitrate concentrations there, you would then need to repair the leaking sewers. So um, that's just one small example of the kinds of studies that are ongoing and um, the kind of platforms we use that I think certainly can um, relate to healthy harbors. So I think that's all I have. I just want to end there um, with this kind of example to tell you where we're coming from with the watershed approach. That's all.
Thank you, Claire. Um, the third speaker from this panel is William Narden, who's an assistant professor at UMSI's at the Horn Point Laboratory. William is a geomorphologist and is going to take a slightly different view about healthy harbors. So when uh, I had the, the title, I was a little bit scared, uh, part from a geomorphological viewpoint, say, uh, what kind of story I can show. So this, uh, I'm trying to make an international story again. So it's, um, you can see this part is like the Trianus part in Rome, so 2000, 2000 years ago. And it's a reconstruction I was built now. Sorry, I was built now, I was built them, but it's, uh, you know, the, but we need that for geomorphology, we need a very large time scale. So this is the goal. So we have a 2,000 years of uh, um, history and uh, sediment deposition and deltaic uh, uh, evolution on the river, on the Tiber River. So how you can see, the, now the coastline is very far. So the, 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 the black line in the, in, the, in the Mediterranean Sea is the, where is the coastline now and uh, the red square is showing where was the harbor. And at that time, there was a really a challenge between uh, Emperor, who was making the best and the biggest uh, port. But, uh, you know, there are a lot of manuscripts on, on the, this story. And, uh, the, you know, Claudius, in the 42 years, he said, OK, I'm going to build a big one. And he got flooded by a storm. And he, he lose like, all the fleet, all the boats, like 200 boats. And then, you know, Trajano was a little bit smarter, 80, 80 years later, say, I'm going to build a little bit inside. And he moved the port inside, smaller, with more, you know, commerce, commercial-wise um, possibility. But, you know, they, but then they also were facing uh, the progression of the delta. So deltas and estuaries, they progressed. You know, at that time, there was no damming along the river, so they just progressed. Sediment supply was coming. And uh, so the, the next slide is showing. So the, the two highlights from this experience say, OK, so ports are affected by sediment supply. If they, and usually harbors and ports, they are built on the deltas and estuaries, so they get a huge amount of, se uh, of sediment. So the, and the, other, the other part is, Ports are usually on the, on just on the coastline, so they are the first to be affected by coastal processes, for example, like storms and uh, coastal flooding. So those are the two lessons that we're going we're gonna to use again in, the, in, the, in this presentation. So moving forward, so this is like now. So it's, but the first thing that I want to say is it's amazing how a seaport now is a high port. So you can see like on the top is Fiumicino High Port. So Fiumicino High Port is built on Claudius seaport. So it's a simple a port, or oh, two minutes, okay. So it's, it's, it's just a port, but it's like a, it's a, now a, a harry port. And if you go like in Fumicino Harry Port, you can see like the ruins are all around, even between like a landing line, lanes, you can see like there are, there's a yellow flag, there there's a part of the port. But you know, it, it's, it's happening in Italy because we have too much history, so we have to even buried stuff. So anyways, like 3.5 kilometers from the, 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 the sea now, it's like, uh, you know, a, around uh, two meters per year, the progression. So, and, uh, and they, you can see now it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lake. It's not, it's not a port anymore. And uh, so this drive to today. So today, um, really, uh, ports, we have to face ports in a, in a different way. So f this is a really important paper by Temmerman et al. and other Dutch guy, though it's a, it's a really pioneer paper showing uh, in the first row you have like uh, estuaries and deltas and uh, on the columns you have uh, the um, different uh, approach like conventional coastal engineering and the soft engineering like uh, ecosystem based coastal defense so the um, as you can see in the first row so we have like a dike that dikes all around the estuaries they make uh, like you know even with the, with the dredging they make like the propagation of the the flooding uh, increasing inside the estuary because it's like this effect of uh, constraining the tide constraining the storms and then on the coastlines we to protect cities we build sea walls groins to trap sediment but if you go on the soft engineering column you can see that if you open the dikes probably you can flood the salt marsh, make sediment reaching that part of the marsh where it's uh, starving sediment. They need sediment to accreate. They also have like an important role in uh, um, uh, dissipating wave energy and the storm surge. So, and if you dike, it's just making like 
the propagation going forward uh, to the cities. So, and uh, if you move on the on the coast, on the on the sandy coast, you can see uh, a different approach on uh, dunes. So, like if you do like natural nourishment, you just have sediment coming and um, on the on the beach, and then it's this sediment it's transmitted to the dunes. The dunes has the natural barrier defense for the cities on the on the, on the coastlines. So, this is just the last last. Uh, I don't know, is it not going? Okay, this one is the last, uh, you know, just from this paper, like a, um, a last slide showing uh, the global need and, uh, you know, as uh, Professor Liz was showing, like South Asia is really the focus of, you know, the need of, uh, and, uh, and you can see like the circle is showing the amount of, uh, of the millions of people on this part of the world and uh, the colors depend, for example, like the blue is showing like in Miami, as, you know, you can make an ecosystem coastal defense where you can, like uh, for example, like in Miami, you cannot probably, like, you, you can just build a wall and sea wall and try to make some reef to dissipate wave energy, but you cannot do nothing there because there's no space. But it's different in Bangladesh where you have like a green dot and uh, you have a space, you can build like oyster reefs, like uh, salt marsh, mangroves, probably like not salt marsh, mangroves, and they can help to dissipate this storm energy during uh, flood events. So I think I'm out. Okay, thank you. Thank you, William. Uh, fourth panelist is also from UMSI's Lisa Wanger. Um, and Lisa's mission is to just to remind us that ports are there for a reason, and it's the societal reason. Lisa. Oh, I can tell William was here. Okay, uh, so my theme is incentives, and I've structured this as a lightning talk, so that means you know it will be quick. I hope it will be painless. So moving along. Uh, so we have visions of where we want to get to with our sustainable ports, whether it's Chinese sponge cities where they're designing cities to be resilient to extreme weather and hold more water, or, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, okay, well, is this on, is it, there we go, okay, sorry. Or the, this is the Port Covington rendering uh, for Baltimore of a mixed-use facility. So we know what we'd like these uh, economically vibrant, climate-ready, and healthy urban systems to look like, but how do we get there? That's obviously the key question. And so we need incentives to get people moving in the same direction. So here's a quick example. I, I, so I have three points about how we get there, three types of incentives, and one is creating effective partnerships. I know many of you in this room are already very actively working on those kinds of partnerships. Uh, but here's just one quick example. Uh, the Maryland Port Administration needs to dredge channels to keep the shipping lanes open, and then they need to put that dredge material somewhere. So they have a very effective way of working with communities to ask them, you know, what kind of projects would you like to see? And in this uh, rendering of Fleming Park, uh, it's, it's come together very well that they were able to place, their, well, the vision is, they're working on the funding for this project now, but the vision is they'll use that sediment to cap toxic sediments. That will have benefits for, for people and aquatic systems. They'll deliver an urban amenity, a waterfront access amenity to an underserved community, and also prevent erosion and promote coastal resiliency. So this is uh, just a great example, I think, where you can take uh, someone who has money to do something and find a way to meet multiple goals. Next, if I can get this to work. The second point is that we really need to align incentives across people, and that means using all the types of incentives that we have at our disposal, be they legal requirements, market incentives, or uh, social pressures. And I'll just give you one very quick example that I heard about recently uh, from New York Harbor, where they had a need to do an in-water impact. So there's a regulation that if you do an in-water impact, you must mitigate. And they had the ability to do the in-water impact in a way that would be more environmentally friendly by using concrete that was specially designed to harbor a more diverse aquatic life. 
but it was gonna be a lot more costly to do that. So what was the incentive that was eventually given to them? Well, they were gonna uh, have less mitigation as a result of building this in a more ecologically friendly way. So that's one way we can align incentives. Uh, so that we give people a financial incentive to, uh, well, first of all, we had the legal incentive that they had to do the mitigation. Then we give them a financial incentive to think more creatively. And the third point is we, we kind of need to trick ourselves into planning ahead. So I study behavioral economics, and some of you may be familiar with this, that we find that our choices often diverge from what we ourselves would consider our best course of action. Oh, there I go again. Um, and so because of this, and, and those of you who haven't fully funded your retirement account, you know what I mean. Uh, so uh, how do we trick ourselves into thinking ahead, particularly when it comes to something as far away as climate change? We're not so far away, now we learn. But, um, and, and so we need to think creatively about overcoming our predictably irrational selves, as some have uh, phrased it. Uh, so, so on the one hand, people often ask my team to come up with economic analyses to show the benefits of programs. And so, whoop, there I go again. Um, so there on the left, uh, that's an example of a, a study we did for the Port Administration where we showed that there were substantial health benefits from replacing old polluting trucks. And that's a very powerful tool, but we need to combine that with other types of information. And so on the right, I'm showing a visual of a flood in Annapolis. And we know from uh, behavioral economic research that something as simple as feeding the imagination of what will happen if you don't act can actually change people's behavior. So we need to apply that, in, that understanding of how we are really two, we have two goals at once often to uh, avoid thinking ahead and just doing what we need to do to get through the day, but also caring about the future. So I'd say our science can come together to support action by thinking about what are the most cost-effective ways to achieve our goals. That includes a lot of ecology and economics and engineering and, and, and. And then, but we also need to think about whether we're designing projects in ways that are incentive compatible. And this is how economists can really help you the most in terms of looking at whether you're scaling the, the project appropriately to get the response you want, uh, whether you're aligning these various types of incentives. And so that's, that's the vision, so thank you. And our last panel speaker is also from UMSI's uh, research associate professor here from IMET, Eric Schott. Thank you. I'm going to have to refer to my notes to stay on target here. Um, I think it's good that I followed all these people because I think I bring in a lot of the themes here and it'll help explain why I'm saying what I'm saying. Um, Baltimore Harbor is like many post-industrial cities. Uh, it's undergone a transition from having a harbor that's receiving pollutants to one that is seen as an environmental asset to both businesses and tourism. But the harbor is still impacted by legacy contaminants, urban runoff, sewage, and hardened shorelines. And in Baltimore, for over a decade, businesses, nonprofits, uh, and government organizations have been working together towards a harbor that's healthy. Um, the Waterfront Business Coalition has put forth a vision of the harbor that would be swimmable and fishable by 2020. And local advocacy groups have been regularly monitoring sewage in the harbor for the past six to eight years. Um, the city of Baltimore is actually currently under a consent decree from the EPA to repair its long neglected sewage infrastructure. And UMSI's, using its uh, molecular technologies and expertise, is working with the University of Baltimore to help the city distinguish between human and non-human sources of fecal coliform bacteria. Recent studies um, by Blue Water Baltimore actually indicate that the harbor may soon meet the swimmable criteria most of the time. But does the absence of sewage uh, in the harbor mean that it's healthy? Probably not. If we take the fishable, uh, how do I push this into the green button? If we take the fishable part of that fishable and swimmable, um, the vision of a harbor that's healthy for an assemblage of fish species implies the presence of a complex food web that includes phytoplankton, zooplankton, prey fish, and associated microbes. The idea of restoring the harbor just raises the question of what we're restoring it to 
And what are the current baseline conditions that are there now? The ecology of urban estuaries is really remarkably poorly understood in contrast to what Claire was telling us about how much is known about the watershed. We know very relatively little about urban waters because they've traditionally not been studied as well as more pristine areas. Uh, they don't lend themselves to the methods that were developed in other areas. It's hard to stain a dredge channel and the contaminants and the debris in the water are actually a hazard to the, to the researchers themselves. And adding to that challenge, Baltimore, for example, is, its harbor is actually a mosaic of different habitats with a variety of habitat and shoreline structures. So to understand this, we're going to need to con conduct repeated sampling on a smaller sort of granular scale, which really can be expensive and laborious. So biodiversity studies are going to need to use new technologies to increase efficiency of measuring biological diversity and abundance. For example, DNA barcoding and eDNA methods are being used globally to visualize biodiversity, especially organisms that are small, rare, or hard to observe. So in a pilot study, UMSIS is collaborating with the National Aquarium and Maryland Sea Grant to use metabarcoding as a way to uh, look at the diversity of life surrounding um, a, model, a prototype model urban waterfront that the aquarium is proposing to put in right outside here. A central tool of the biodiversity study is to use these low-tech acrylic discs that you see in the center of the, of the slide there to accumulate developing communities on an annual basis, which can then be queried using videography and then looking, quantifying animals on those videos, as well as extracting DNA from a section of each of those discs and using metabarcoding and a bioinformatic pipeline to create um, a species list of you know, abundance and diversity of species based on DNA sequences. So as um, Tom mentioned earlier, this metabarcoding approach is actually being used with Laura Harris and Ryan Woodland who are conducting an ecology study of the larger Baltimore Harbor um, to try to understand um, the effects of all these factors I talked to you about on water quality, uh, species diversity, and especially oxygen levels. And so there are two additional technologies I think that we need to take in to, to bring into play. One, um, is an automated camera system developed on buoys or deployed on buoys that can continuously sample and record and identify thousands of images per hour. Um, and the other imaging system is sonar based and can visualize and identify and count fish species and larger zooplankton uh, as well. Um, this latter technology is being used by UMSIs in the estuaries of Southern Maryland. So in addition to the science, I think you know, this documentation of biodiversity has other important uses. So it can let you understand the urban estuary from the biological perspective. It lets you um, measure the effects of restoration activities on the ecosystem at sort of that species level. But importantly, it can be used to create narratives and produce images about the life in the harbor that can be shared with stakeholders of all types. And I think it's important to start using these technologies soon to begin to create long-term data sets and spark collaborations with scientists and non-scientists. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. So now we have time for some questions from the audience. Um, and I saw one hand shoot up from the beginning. Is it on? Claire, what was that jump in 2013 in the agricultural nitrate coming? The um, manure spreading practices changed. Uh, this is at McDonough School where they have a big horse farm. So it was manure spreading practices that changed and we could see the signature in water quality. Yeah. Other questions from the audience on, on the big questions and challenges with working in urban ports? So, Don? can't hear you. <laughs> the elephant in the room is the projection of much more rapid rates of sea level rise, particularly if we don't stop the, the rate of warming. And, uh, and our ports, uh, contrary to the port in Italy, which was overwhelmed by land building, now we're going to have ports that are overwhelmed by sea rising. And uh, that has implications not only for the waterfront itself and for maritime commerce, has implications also for runoff and as streams back up and that gradient changes. So how in an area like Baltimore, which is susceptible to this, I mean, we already see it when we have these storms and high water levels here, how can we bring our science in 
all of its dimensions to help envision uh, this future that this city is going to experience, not only environmentally, but socially? Well, one thing is we can learn from what other cities are doing. So there are cities who are ahead of us. Miami routinely has stormwater backing up into the streets every day, and so they've installed this elaborate system of pumps. This is an engineering solution to try to you know, remove the water, and that's just from garden variety storms. It's not even from you know, just long-term sea level rise. So I think there can be lessons learned from looking at our partners, and New York City is also having the same problems of their, of their just their, from sea level rise, of their storm sewers backing up on a routine basis, and they're trying to address that various measures. So I think we can look at all those and try to translate some of that knowledge to Baltimore. Joseph? Yeah, I think in, in Hong Kong, uh, we've done it two ways. One is uh, right now we are factoring effects of uh, climate change into our stormwater design codes. So in other words, if you design for a, used to be a one in 200 year flood, then it's one in 200 year flood plus climate change. So there's a scientific way of doing it now uh, with all the GCM models. But the other thing is, uh, we, we, over the past 10 years, we've actually adopted a sponge city solution, going to deep tunnels. Uh, in other words, we intercept three-pronged solution. One is upstream, we built like a system of uh, 34 intakes, like deep, going into a deep tunnel. And then mid-catchment, mid we build storage schemes. And thirdly, the traditional scheme. So three-prong approach to enhance, uh, to prevent flooding in the central business district. So recently we had this very uh, severe manga, this typhoon. We were okay, right, the, mm. the, the day after. But it's a, lot, a very costly solution. Yeah, very, very yeah. costly. Lisa or Eric, did I see you about, uh, mm. you were just checking. Time for one more question. Lady in the, towards the back. Lauren. So um, you're talking in engineering versus ecological solutions. Um, and I think the third panelist talked about the concept of using wetland, you know, wetlands as buffers, which is great. You know, riparian systems have historically been shown to really reduce the impacts of nutrients and toxins and stuff like that. But looking from an urban perspective, we all know that wetlands are so sensitive to any you know, chemical or human impact. So I'm wondering how long-term these riparian and wetland ecological solutions are. And I think in a more ideal world, we would go for the environmental solution rather than the engineering solution. But thinking of human behavior, how really v viable are wetland solutions in an urban setting? William, do you want to? It's on? Okay. So the, um, I think uh, there are different theory, first of all, like uh, on the sea level rise and how the salt marsh, they readjust with the, uh, you know, the, uh, so some of this theory just, just say that, you know, the salt marsh is going to migrate a little bit on the back and uh, interact more with the upland uh, marsh. But um, I, I guess, you know, from, from a modeling uh, perspective, uh, what we saw usually from the models is like, uh, we, the, the marsh is going, is going to be like a more trying to trap sediment on the boundary and trying to accrete and try to make like more a dam with the, but you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking only like by the physics part, like, you know, the sediment has a, has a, um, has a you know, a, a brick to build something in the marsh, right? So, um, because uh, every time I'm thinking and I was interacting with other colleagues saying, oh, I would love to see like more sediment in the Chesapeake Bay, but they say like, no, 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 come on. It's going to be like a, a water quality problem. Say, so, okay, you're right. But you know, in my mind, I'm thinking I need sediment to build up the marsh because the marsh has to readjust. And so far, with all the damming and all around the world, marsh are not really able to react in some way from, like, you know, from a physical point of view. And, we'll, you know, and I went in a conference last summer uh, with Peter, he invited me to go like in coastal engineering, and the engineers were there saying, okay, we, we have to know how many kilometers we need to, to dissipate one meter of wave. It's, if someone can tell us, the, there are no numbers so far. So we, there are, we, are, we are working on it. So, right, we are just, you know, ecosystem based is a good idea, but we have to make numbers 
make plots. They make you know showing how those two the physics is going to react with the you know with the extreme events like uh, um, uh, storms or uh, sea level rise. I address the question. Oh, okay. Sadly, I think we're going to have to end it there. I'll ask you to first of all thank the panelists for their comments and their presentations. Um, I will encourage you, for those who do have questions, to engage with the panelists over, over lunch.